Hello and welcome back. I am Joe Moragrega, your co-host. And I'm Carlo Ramirez. How are you? We now have a very special guest. Uh, his name is Javier Ramirez, and he's a developer advocate at AWS. Hello, Javier. How are you doing today? Hi, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I'm very good, thank you. And I hope the audience is fresh after, you know, the, the, the whole two days of our talks. Yeah, we are all enjoying, <laughs> right? The, the celebration that, that we're having today and, and to yesterday. And thank you, we're so glad and so happy that, that we can that you can share some of your thought and your, your experience with us, right? Sure. If uh, just the people, for the people who don't know Javier, Javier is a developer advocate at AWS. What that means is that he helps developers make the most out of uh, AWS. He is uh, passionate for distributed, scalable, and always on systems. And, and the topic of his, of his presentation will be how AWS is reinventing the cloud, you know? So before we start, I ask to the listeners that if you have any question, use the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, we will uh, answer that. Okay, Javier, are you ready to start? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, whenever okay. you are. <laughs> well, I'll leave you the presentation, and we'll be back in a moment. Lovely, thank you. Let me just get this one interface back so I can see the chat. And now you will be seeing my screen, hopefully so. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Javier. As you know, I was kindly of the introduce, uh, I work at AWS and one part of what I do is actually is, is, uh, speaking with developers, with clinical audiences in general, about what's possible with the cloud, which are the best practices and uh, how we can help you. But the other part, which is very important for me, is actually understanding how uh, technical teams are using or, or how they are not using uh, AWS. So if you have any feedback about our services, if you have any comments about uh, what you would like to see next on cloud, feel free to reach out. My uh, LinkedIn uh, or my Twitter messages are always open. So yeah, yes, pass me any feedback. I'll make sure it reaches the service team so we can be for everyone. And today I wanted to speak about how AWS is reinventing the cloud because cloud has been around for a while. We started operating at AWS over 15 years ago. And in those 15 years, cloud has been evolving. But uh, I sometimes hear people get the idea that cloud is still just some, somebody else's server. And, and yeah, I get it, it's a joke. But yeah, there are many things we are still developing, even in boring things like computation or, or so on. We are making many new things. So I wanted to give you an overview of some of the uh, ways in which cloud is changing. So uh, I'm going to be focusing mostly on infrastructure, then a little bit on serverless, and the last part on machine learning. But yeah, I want to give you an overview of you know, how we are changing the cloud landscape. So the first thing, when AWS started, it was a very simple thing. I mean, very simple. It was on data centers, in different regions of the world, of course, with a lot of high reliability, with some sophisticated services. But in the end, when we started, it was mostly storage and virtual machines and load balancers and auto scalers and uh, messaging between the application and not much more. And of course, we started adding more and more services and we started adding more and more capacity. So in the first few years, we open different regions in different parts of the world. And in the past few years, we've been a bit more active. So as of today, we have a global footprint, which is a bit more interesting. So we have 25 different regions and there are more that are coming in the next few years, uh, seven more that are coming in the next few years. So the global footprint of AWS, the global footprint of the cloud is already getting way bigger, but today, I'm going to be speaking about things that happen outside of the data center because the AWS cloud is not only our data centers, it's much more than that. So as of today, we have over 25, we have 25 regions, sorry, and regions are divided into what we call availability zones. And I will tell you in a bit what that means. And they are connected, of course, with our global network infrastructure. Something I wanted to get out of the way as soon as possible is this. We have announced 
they are going to be opening a new infrastructure region in Spain. So it's going to be operating by mid of 2022. So if you are already using AWS and you are using AWS uh, in any other region, in any other data centers, for example, in Frankfurt or Ireland or Stockholm, or I don't know, or Paris, uh, now you will be able in 2022, you will be able to deploy your workloads on AWS. I know many of you today are listening from a very regulated industries, like for example, finance or banking or healthcare. And um, sometimes those industries have very strict requirements for data residency. So once the new region is open, uh, you will be able to deploy your workloads on AWS in Spain, making sure your data never leaves the country. And that's really quite interesting. And I was telling you before about availability zones. So what does it mean? Well, we are going to be opening the Spain region in Aragon, and we are going to be deploying three availability zones. An availability zone means a part of the infrastructure which is completely separated from the others. And for you to get the idea, we are going to be deploying in Aragon in three different cities. One in Huesca, which is North of Spain, then we are going to be deploying in El Burgo de Ebro and Villanova de Gallego. So these are three different cities, three different towns. They are about 50 kilometers, uh, you know, in a straight line from each other. So they are quite separate in case there is a natural disaster. I, I hope there is not a natural disaster. Actually, I was born in that part of Spain. So I hope there is not a natural disaster, but imagine there is a flooding or there is like any major incident in the region. Well, having this infrastructure 50 kilometers apart, it allows you to have very low latency. At the same time, it allows you to have a lot of protection. And this is the way every other region in AWS operates. Also to support these uh, regions, we are also uh, creating, we are building some uh, solar plants in Spain. We have the first one operating already in Sevilla. We are creating a second one, which we hope we will start operations uh, this year in Zaragoza. And we are creating three new ones. The last one in Castilla-La Mancha was announced just yesterday. So we are going to have five solar plants in Spain. So we can power all of the AWS and Amazon business in the region with green energy, with solar energy. So that, you know, that, that was just, uh, to, so, so I could tell you a little bit what we are doing in the country. So coming back to the availability zones and to the global infrastructure and how we are reinventing this. So uh, one thing we believe at AWS, this is Bernard Bogles, this is our CTO, the CTO for the whole Amazon group. So at AWS, we firmly believe that everything fails all the time. So when you are deploying applications, when you are deploying any kind of infrastructure, you have to understand that at some point, especially at the scale, things are going to break. So you need to provision for this failure to happen while your application still runs. So you have to provide for resilience, for high availability. And we give you the means for that. I told you about the availability zones. You can deploy your workloads in multiple zones. If you deploy an application, part of the, uh, of the machines are running in one zone in one region. Another part of the application is running in, other, in another zone in the same region. If one goes down because there is a power failure, a hardware breaks down, uh, someone with a truck you know, uh, crash against a wall and there is a, a major hardware incident that could happen when someone is doing deliveries. Of course, it's not common, but it could happen. Well, if you are running multiple ability zones, you should be protected from those things. And many of the services that we offer, they actually deploy automatically in multiple zones. So you don't have to worry about that. If you want to have increased reliability, uh, you could always deploy also in multiple regions. But for most customers, you don't really need to do that. If you only want to have high availability, being in just one region with multiple zones should be good enough. But of course, infrastructure is not only about the data centers. It's also about connectivity. So we have connectivity to our network, not only in the countries where we have availability zones, but also in many other places. So we, have, uh, we are present in, in another 37 countries and we offer 230 point of presence. That means termination of the network. So you can connect to the AWS network from a place which is much closer to you than the data center. And once you enter that network, your, uh, your data is traveling inside AWS backbone. So all of, all of our uh, 
data centers on the regions are interconnected. But this backbone, and basically, once you enter the network, no matter if you enter through one of the point of presence of the CDN, or if you enter directly through a data center, your data is not going to be living in AWS. So it's going to be uh, faster because you don't have to be jumping over the internet. We are using our uh, private network. And also it's more secure because once your data enters AWS, it's not going to be jumping through any other uh, network provider. So th that's, you know, that's quite a standard, nothing too interesting. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not reinventing. It's just more, more of the same thing. This is just for setting the context, by the way, if you have your own data center, and that's something very important I'll speak about today, you have your own data center and you want to connect your on-premise uh, data center with the, net, with the AWS cloud, you can use any of the direct connect locations. And again, we have more than 100 direct connect locations in the world. So you can connect your data center directly to AWS if you want to run hybrid workloads in which part of the workload is running on the cloud, part is running on uh, your uh, on premises. If you look inside an AWS data center, you are going to find a lot of custom hardware because at our scale, it's not efficient and, and it's not really, uh, in some cases, it's not possible to operate without custom made hardware. So you have custom made hardware for uh, security of the networking communications, for example, custom hardware for the virtualization of the servers, custom hardware for networking custom hardware for load balancing, custom hardware for storage. We have a lot of different custom hardware running behind the scenes to power all of this. And we give you also a lot of choice when it comes to which type of server you want to run. So when you are in on AWS, and there's something quite interesting, you can choose between over 300 different type of, of machines, of virtual machines with different characteristics, some of them have high memory, if you want to run, for example, uh, big data analytics on an in-memory database, some of them has very fast networking, up to 400 gigabits per second between instance, between different machines in the same um, data center. Some of the uh, machines are specifically designed for fast storage or for large storage. You can choose between many different uh, options. Also operating system, different categories. So you can choose you know, many different machines, including the choice of CPUs. We are the only cloud provider that offers you the choice of using Intel machines, AMD machines, our own uh, ARM-based hardware. We have uh, a division of the company which designs and builds chips and part of those chips is the Graviton family, which are very efficient. They give you more power for less money running on the ARM architecture. The ARM architecture is very popular lately because it's the one powering, for example, the new Apple M1 machines or the one powering uh, many of the chips on your phones. So we built on top of that and we are already on the second generation. We've been, we've been offering this kind of chips in our data center for the virtual machines for over three years now. So basically you can also choose ARM processors which are optimized for the cloud. And you can even choose since a few months ago, you can choose to run some Mac instances directly on the cloud. So you have a lot of choice when it comes to uh, how you want to run your workloads because of course different workloads have different needs. So that's one of the innovations I wanted to talk about that you can really have the type of uh, hardware, the type of chip you really need for your workloads, but the API, the way of interacting with all of them is exactly the same. I don't care if you are running an, an, a Mac machine or an Intel machine, if you want to connect to the network, if you want to connect to the storage, if you want to use the AWS services, the API, the interface is always exactly the same because we are building all that virtualization so you don't have to worry about those things. We also offer specialized chips for machine learning and for, you know, uh, high performance computation, but I don't want to speak about that today because you know that will be a much, much longer talk. So I, I'm speaking now, okay, so this is about hardware. This is about the choice you have for running, of course, your instances and a lot of customers like this. And of course we have many customers. We have millions of customers, active users using AWS. And they really like our approach to building data centers in the cloud. But I told you earlier that the cloud is not only data centers, the cloud is changing shape. And we've been listening to customers for the past few years 
And some of them have been telling us, hey, we are super happy with the situation we just described with the global uh, network of regions on AWS, availability zones, network connectivity, choice of hardware, different services. It sounds super good and, and, and it works and it's helping my business. But we hear from some customers that have different requirements. Some customers, they need to operate on premises, at least part of the workloads because of many reasons. It might be because they need ultra low latency. They might need single digits uh, millisecond latency. It might be because they, uh, they have a strong data residency requirements and we don't have a region maybe uh, on, their, uh, on the area. It might be for many different reasons that they want to operate on premises. And for those customers, we didn't have a really, I mean, we had a good solution, but it was not ideal. We also see another type of, uh, of uh, customer in which they want to have very low latency, but they don't want to operate their own data center. So I'll tell you a little bit how we are helping these customers and how the cloud is starting to be something more than just the data centers. Of course, all the customers, if you are operating in an hybrid environment, you want to have the same experience when deploying locally or when deploying to the cloud, because you don't want to have different teams having uh, different skills only because you are deploying on your data center or you are deploying in the cloud. In many cases, it's just an application, it's just different parts of the application running on one part or the other. So ideally, you want to reuse all that skill, you want to reuse all that knowledge that your team is already doing on learning in AWS, so you can operate in the same way on your data center. That's kind of the idea. So what we are building now, it's this kind of new architecture in which we try to help those specific customers. For most people, don't get me wrong, you're just going to be using the cloud as you have been doing uh, in the past. So this thing you see here on the left. Uh, for some customers running IoT or running in very disconnected environments here in the right, we have solutions for them. I'm not going to be speaking today about IoT or about disconnected environments because that will be for another talk. But I'm going to be to center here in the center part. For those customers, that are running on premises or those customers that want to have ultra low latency running with their own infrastructure or running on, on 5G networks. So the first use case will be for the customers that are operating their own data centers and they want to have the cloud experience, but they cannot really operate on the cloud because they need to be uh, on premises. And for them, we created, I believe it was uh, over two years ago, we created something called AWS Outpost. So Outpost basically uh, helps those, those customers that already have the data centers, they operate their own hardware, they have racks of servers, they have their own power, they have their own network, they have the knowledge on site to manage all the hardware and so on and so forth. And they want to have uh, a part of the installation that is using the same APIs that they are using on AWS. So basically what we are giving you here is like, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to, a couple of slides are too repetitive. So this is an Outpost rack. So with Outpost, what uh, we are going to give you is we give you this rack. We have also a smaller racks, but for the basic version, the one we have right now in operation, if you are a data center, if you are a company with your own data center, you can ask for this kind of rack. So it's a 42 year rack. It's quite, quite big, as you can imagine. We operate this rack, you don't operate it. So we take this to your data center. We uh, ask you to connect your power and your network, and that's about it. Then we close the rack and we do the maintenance. So uh, we also have the access to the physical keys. If, you, if, if anyone without authorization opens the rack, it's going to destroy the encryption keys, so all the data will be rendered unavailable because you don't have the encryption key. So we have very strict security measures here. So what is running here is hardware provided by AWS. It's our custom hardware. It's running our services. So once you, we put this on your data center, you are going to be able to operate the same services. Imagine, for example, S3, our storage service. So S3 is available on this, uh, on this uh, hardware or for example, EC2. 
our virtual machine solution. It's also available in this hardware for RDS, our database solution, also available here. So if you want to use our services, you can uh, request one of these racks, one of these outposts. We send it to your data center. You give me the power and the connectivity. Uh, we configure to connect to your network. And then you can, with very low latency, because it's local in your data center, you can interact with AWS services, but you use the AWS APIs. The only difference when you deploy an application to this outpost or to the cloud is the endpoint you are using. If you are using the local, uh, when you deploy this, you will have like a new virtual region on your uh, console. So you choose if you are deploying to one of the official regions or to your local outpost. That's the only difference. But you have full control of how you deploy by using exactly the same APIs. So it makes your life much easier. It makes your, uh, your hybrid infrastructure very much easier to manage. So uh, of course, now it's, it's still under preview, but this year we are going to start offering also a smaller form factor. So if, if a 42 use uh, rack is too big, you can also request one U or two use. And this is very interesting. For example, uh, I don't know if you want to have a kind of portable installation on, on a hospital or something like that, and you don't want the whole uh, infrastructure, you could request one of these, but the idea is exactly the same. And um, they are already available. The outpost has been available for at least two years and it's very widely supported. We support 56 countries already with outposts and multiple regions, of course, of AWS to interconnect. And we already announced if you are going to be using the new Spain region, outpost is going to be supported by the outpost region. So if you are listening from Spain and it's interesting for you, just be aware when we announce the uh, region next year, you will be able to run in this particular way on AWS. And these are some of the services you can deploy on Outpost. You can deploy databases, you can uh, do the backups from your uh, local disk, you can do migrations with Cloud Endure, you can deploy Hadoop or Spark workloads with EMR, you can use the load balancers directly on that track. You have Elastic Cache with uh, Redis or Main Cache for uh, local caching. You can work with Kubernetes or with Docker containers on ECS. You have access, of course, to storage and computation. So you have a number of services and we are increasing the number of services that you can use in a, in a uh, seamlessly way when you are deploying with Outpost. So that will be the first way in which cloud is already getting out, out of data centers. There is another way which is uh, interesting. And we call this the local zones. So now imagine that you are a company and uh, you have very strict latency requirements. You want to have uh, responses from the cloud in single digit milliseconds, but you don't want to operate your own hardware, your own data center. And this will happen, for example, with uh, companies doing 3D animation or doing uh, fluid simulation. If you are an artist and you are doing a render of a movie, you need that to respond in milliseconds, not in 20 milliseconds, more like in two to five milliseconds. Otherwise, it doesn't feel fluid. So if you operate in the cloud, unless you are super close to the data center, you are never going to be getting single digit milliseconds. Maybe you are getting 15 milliseconds, 20 if you are lucky. But yeah, uh, less than 10 is going to be hard to be you know, uh, to get less than 10 milliseconds connectivity with the, uh, with the network. But you, we see many customers, especially in some specific parts of the world, they need access to ultra low latency zones. So we had this idea of building what we call the local zones. And this is the way it works. I'm, I'm going to put you an example because with an example, totally, uh, it's easier to understand. Would we see a lot of digital artists working on LA, on Los Angeles. Of course, Hollywood is there. A lot of movie studios operate from there. There is a large industry in Los Angeles. Um, those people couldn't use the cloud for some use cases because it was not interactive enough for them. So what we have done, we've built a local zone on LA, on Los Angeles. A local zone is a small data center that we operate. That data center depends on the larger data center in California. But this is in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. So it's just a few kilometers from these companies. 
So these companies can use the resources of the local zones, and there is only a subset of resources on that zone, but they can use those resources and they can operate at very uh, low scale, uh, sorry, at very low latency. And the first uh, two local zones that we built, they were in Los Angeles because of the movie industry, in Boston because of research. There are a lot of research uh, facilities, companies and universities around the Boston metropolitan area. So we build those two local zones and we've been announcing more local zones coming in the near future. As of today, I believe we have only local zones in the US, but that's going to change. We are going to be opening local zones also in other areas. And basically the, they allow you to do this kind of things. For example, some gaming companies, they are using this so they can deploy uh, their applications to zones which are close to large cities. So customers playing from those cities have a much more fluid experience. And the APIs, the way of controlling this uh, is exactly the same. One of the customers you have, for example, is Netflix. So you can imagine the kind of you know, things we are doing with them. But as you know, that's the idea from the local zones. Again, a different way of thinking of if infrastructure and how cloud is getting out of the uh, data centers. And the last, the last way in which we are getting out of the data center, I believe is quite interesting. Uh, now, everybody's speaking about 5G. And 5G is super interesting. Once you have an operator in your country, which is operating with 5G, and you have coverage in your area, and if your phone supports 5G, you have access to super fast connectivity, very low latency. And that's super interesting because it allows you to provide a much better, a much better uh, user experience for your customers. You are going to be able to connect from the mobile with probably single digit latency, maybe, uh, maybe double digit latency, depending where you are in the city with the 5G network. And the bandwidth you have is also very high. So that's super interesting. But the challenge is if you are deploying, if you are connecting from your phone, to the mobile network of your uh, operator, you are going to get to the operator network, the CSP. This is the, the, the network of your uh, telco operator. And if they connect to AWS, it's going to take at least uh, tens of milliseconds latency to do this connectivity. So that means 5G is super fast, but if the provider is hosting the application in the cloud, they are going to add those milliseconds latency and then you are losing some of the advantages of, of 5G. We have some customers, some telco customers, which are uh, operating in parts of the world that we, they are deploying outposts. The rack I, I told you earlier, we deploy the outpost on their data center so they can run the 5G workloads locally on their data centers. And that was interesting for them because you know, in that, in that case, uh, you can run directly on the data center and provide very low latency experience to your customers. But it was a bit too much to, to operate, you know, to request the cloud, the, the outpost and so on. So we had this idea. What if we could create this experience in which you connect to your uh, operator, to your telco operator, and inside the network of your operator, we deploy some infrastructure. And we call this wavelength. The wavelength is a specific use case only for telecommunications company operating their own 5G networks in which we can deploy our hardware into the telco provider. So the telco provider can run here inside, the, uh, inside the, their uh, local premises. They can run here some AWS services. If uh, customers connect to this, uh, to this zone, and the data they need is already here, they can send the data back without adding any latency at all because they are running locally on their own data center. I adding maybe a couple of milliseconds if, if you know, because they are locally into the uh, data center. If they need to uh, get some data that is not on this cell, on this antenna, then they can just uh, request it to AWS and maybe cache locally. So that's what we are building to help all the customers running on 5G to have a better experience if your telecommunication company is adopting Wavelength. So basically, in this way, you are going to be able to, again, the operators can use the same APIs, the same services, both 
on the uh, edge of the network and also on AWS. So as a, if you are a, a developer deploying a 5G, uh, a 5G application, if you are deploying on AWS, and if you have your telco operator is supported by AWS, you can choose to deploy part of the application to the edge. So it's going to be much more uh, responsive for your users. So the kind of things you will put here on the edge will be uh, a subset of the data. For example, a user data profile or recent pictures or something like that. Uh, you will put here anything, for example, machine learning. If you need to uh, do machine learning on the edge, it will be on this, on this end of the spectrum. And on the data center, you will have other things. Authentication, which is not really latency sensitive because you do this one per session, so you don't really need to do authentication. Maybe having the master database in which you get a subset to the edge. So you have the full capability as a developer to choose how you distribute this. But the idea is you have the freedom to choose if you are deploying uh, on AWS, if you are deploying on the edge, or if you are doing a mix of deploying on both cases. And we see more and more users that are taking advantage of these uh, deployments. Of course, in healthcare, if you have connected devices, which are only in the hospital, it's uh, interesting to have as low latency as possible. We see a lot in connected vehicles, not really uh, for self-driving vehicles, but for all the assistance around. That's something we are seeing a lot. With IoT, we see more and more use cases in which you are running analytics or you are running predictive maintenance uh, and you need to have some feedback from the cloud. And again, this will benefit a lot. Gaming, media, ER industries, there are a lot of use cases that we see are adopting already this kind of architecture. And we are already present in some places. Until a few days ago, we were not present yet in Europe, but as of today, we have already the first uh, Europe partner, Vodafone in the UK. We hopefully will be expanding the partnership with Vodafone to other countries and will be also expanding to other partners. We uh, are already in uh, Japan and Singapore. We have a uh, lot of partners already in the uh, United States. And as you can see, a lot of metro, metro areas cover with wavelength. So we hope this will be expanding. But what I wanted to tell you in this first part of the presentation was, OK, the cloud is not only data centers interconnected. We are getting not only data centers. We also have the points of presence and direct connect for, uh, you know, to connect in an easier way to the network in AWS. We have the local zones. That uh, we have announced 12 new local zones for those customers with ultra low latency requirements, but they don't want to operate their own data center. We have the outpost for those customers that have their own data centers. And we have now Wavelength in 13 different locations, uh, which is for those 5G operators that want to offer this experience. So developers can choose to deploy applications on the edge, combining cloud and edge. So that's, that's quite interesting, but I've been speaking, hopefully that's quite interesting, but I've been speaking only about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And if you are a developer, you don't care about this. I, I used to be a developer in the past. Now I work more with data machine learning and I don't care about this. I couldn't care less about hardware. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, uh, oh yeah, it looks cool, but I don't care about this. As a developer, what I want is to use, uh, to worry less about operations, to worry less about the hardware, and to focus on the business logic. And um, for a few years already, we've been seeing a, a big shift in how we are building applications, uh, the, the developer community in general. Modern applications are not built like in the past. We are now we use microservices, we use containers, we try not to build huge monoliths that we have to deploy in one go. At the very least, you deploy your applications in a smaller monoliths that you can deploy independently. But uh, we've been seeing a lot of change. And this conference is also, of course, about DevOps. And DevOps is all about this. It's all about being able to work in a more agile way with CI and CD, automating absolutely everything, trying to deploy independent units that don't affect to each other, being able to have observability, and, and especially doing less operations, having to worry less about the hardware and abstracting in, in higher 
abstraction layers, all the complexity of working with the physical world, which makes a lot of sense because then you can focus on doing something interesting for the business. And if you want to adopt this modern application development, then you need to think about changing a few things. Of course, how you architecture your applications. You have to think about microservices and you have to, you have to think about uh, service discovery and you have to think about many different things. I'm not going to be covered many of that today, but just you know, to set the context. You need to think about the operational model. You want to manage your own hardware or you want to manage your own virtual machines or you want to manage containers, which is a, a bit better, or you want, to go you want to go fully serverless and not worrying at all about infrastructure. So the more you uh, go up on the operation model, the more freedom you're going to have from the hardware, which is behind. And of course, about software delivery, having the, the, the full DevOps uh, experience about integrating every time there is a new development, making sure we have we put together all the testing, deployment, validation, verification, packaging, security, and we deploy we deploy independently. So that's kind of the idea. And the good thing, you know, the good news is that on AWS, we understand different teams prefer to work in different ways. Maybe because you have legacy code, maybe because your team like me was born in the seventies and they are more comfortable with the old ways of doing things. Maybe because you are, are running uh, on-premise operations or because you have licenses or because whatever, in some cases, you want to operate as close to the metal as possible. In some other cases, you want to operate in a level of abstraction as high as possible. So we allow you to go with different services, for example, take computation. If you want to use a virtual machine, you can use virtual machine. And we even offer you bare metal servers without any virtualization. So you even manage your virtualization. Or you can use, or you can choose to use maybe a managed service, or maybe containers, or maybe serverless containers, or fully serverless functions. It depends where you are. Same thing for databases. You want to have uh, MySQL on a virtual machine, you can operate that. You want to have MySQL managed by us, you can operate that. You want to have a MySQL compatible database, which is built for the cloud, we can operate that. You want to have a fully serverless uh, MySQL database, we can operate that. You want to have a NoSQL database, also we can operate that. So you choose. And we have the same thing for different layers. So it's not only for computation and databases. The idea is you choose in which level of abstractions you are comfortable. Why? Because as, as our CTO says, there is no server easier to manage than no servers. So the moment you have no servers, serverless, it's much easier to manage that if you have to worry about things like, I don't know, servers restarting, I have to do to patch whatever, there is a hard drive which is not responding. So it's much easier. And take, for example, the case of containers. If you choose containers, you can choose uh, to go using just your containers directly on EC2, on virtual machines. You can choose to deploy your containers on any of the two solutions we offer. ECS or EKS. EKS is based on Kubernetes, and ECS is similar to Kubernetes, just easier to manage. Uh, so ECS or EKS, and then you manage the containers. Or you, you, you might want to prefer to use Fargate, which is serverless containers on top of this ECS or EKS, or you want to use maybe serverless functions. Depending where you are, you can see here, you worry about more things or less things. Indeed, at the top, you only provide me the application code and the dependencies, the, li the, the library dependencies. If you are here on serverless, you also have to provide me some configuration and networking. If you are here, you have to also manage the cluster for the containers. If you are at lower level, you have to manage also the operating system. So depending who you are, you are more comfortable in one layer of abstraction or in the other, and it's really up to you. We have customers that use uh, the services in different ways, and that's totally fine because, you know, in, in many cases, if you are not a, a trivial operation, if you are a, a company with a significant workload, you are going to be using different abstractions for different parts of your workloads, and that's totally fine because, you know, in the end, you do what works for you. So what, what does it mean when we talk about serverless? It means that they are servers, but you don't have to worry about them. The servers are running on our infrastructure. I already saw you, it's quite reliable, but you don't have to worry about provisioning, about managing uh, the servers, about the scaling up and down. You only pay for where the, uh, the application is running. For example, if you go to Lambda, 
to the to the fully serverless uh, function as a service uh, experience, you only pay for how many milliseconds your code has been in operations. If you have no operations, you don't pay anything. If you have a lot of requests, we're going to scale automatically. You don't worry about that. You only pay for how much useful work your application has been doing. When there is no one using it, you don't pay. When there's a lot of people, you pay more. No more and no less. And of course, it's as available and secure, if no more, because the attack, is, the attack surface is smaller. So it's as secure as working with any other service in the cloud. Since, since it's event-driven and we provision automatically in milliseconds, you don't have to worry about that. It's fully elastic. You pay only for what you use and you can forget about that. And something important when we are speaking about serverless, people tend to think only about functions and events and storage because that's how it started. When we started uh, offering serverless, it was a very small, very simple model. Events on one side were triggering functions that were using the storage and returning a response. But the landscape in the last few years has changed quite a bit. As of today, you can use serverless for pretty much anything. You can use serverless, of course, for your basic primitives like storage and computation and databases, SQL and NoSQL, but also for application integration, different MSH queues, integrating with external systems with uh, like Amazon Event Bridge, uh, message delivery. Uh, we have a lot of tools to support now, of course, this serverless workload. So now, you, if you want to have observability, if you want to need a serverless repository for your applications, for your packages, if you want to have auditing or uh, governance of your application, you can do that with Config and CloudTrail. If you want to build your CI CD pipelines, we have Code Pipeline. Even if you want to have your own editor, your own ID in the cloud, we have Cloud9. So many different services that you can use to deploy in a serverless way. Many of them for security because security is our top priority, super important. A good thing about the cloud is that since we operate at a very large scale, we, we can afford to uh, hire teams which are significantly larger than the ones that any other company could possibly hire. So it's not that we are smarter, it's just we have more people taking care and paying attention to those things. And we offer exactly the same security, exactly the same services to our customers, no matter if you are a bank, an airline, a government agency, or a small startup. Don't really care about that. Exactly the same services to absolutely everyone. Even for analytics, we have many services that are fully serverless. So as you can see, serverless is not something very limited as it was in the past. If you if you took a, a look at the landscape of serverless five years ago, it would be quite different of what serverless can offer you today. And we keep innovating. Just exactly seven days ago, we announced a low code tool for building these serverless workflows. Because the moment you go serverless or the moment you go microservices, you have many independent components and orchestrating can be difficult. We already had something called state functions to orchestrate the workflows, the inputs and outputs and be failure tolerant and, and define different conditions across multiple services. But it could be tricky if you are building a microservice architecture. Now we announced that, for example, you can create your workflows, your dependencies across different services in a visual way. So you could already do this with JSON or with the API. Now you can also do this on a visual editor. So you can just click, put here the dependencies, which is the input for one service, which is the output for the other, which condition I'm expecting. If it's good, I do this. If it's bad, I do that. I have to wait now. I have to retry if something fails. So all of those things that were already, uh, of course, available before, now you can do from a visual environment, which makes your life just easier. So as you can see, we keep innovating in many different dimensions, not just on hardware, infrastructure, or new services, also in this kind of integration tools to make your life a bit easier. And I told you, on analytics, we also have a lot of solutions for serverless. So I just wanted to show you this, this example about one of the services, AWS Glue, for data transform and data integration. So you can get a little bit the, uh, the idea. If you want to build today a full uh, serverless data lake, fully serverless, it can be done. With the AWS services, you can get data from your serverless databases, streaming data or static data. You can connect to the data, auto-discover the data, catalog the data, 
keep the data on a registry, uh, transform the data using a visual tool or just using data science tools directly on the cloud, on the browser, without writing any code and export that data into your data lake. And from there, you can interact with your data in many different ways, for example, with serverless analytics or with fully managed dashboards. So you can have pretty, pretty complex scenarios working with serverless. And again, I like you know, when, the, when our CTO says interesting things, and this is something he said uh, already three years ago, is that what does the future look like? Well, all the code you ever write is business logic. So you never write code to glue systems together or you don't have to write code to manage with the low level things. It's just business logic so you can focus on providing value to the business. And the last three minutes, I wanted to dedicate to speak about something uh, which I still haven't mentioned and you probably have in your mind, which is, okay, so hardware, uh, serverless, what about the elephant in the room? What about machine learning? Everybody's crazy today about machine learning, about artificial intelligence, and we are as well. So we have more than any other cloud provider, more, more customers than any, anywhere else, deploying machine learning workloads on AWS. And that's very interesting for us because it allows us to see many different use cases. So those customers complain when they don't like something. When they complain, we improve the cloud and we add new services. And in the past few years, we've been offering many different services. If you took a look at this slide four years ago, it will be much smaller. So these are almost all the services we offer today for machine learning. If you're an application developer at this top layer, AI services, this is all machine learning in which you only interact with an API. You don't need to know any machine learning to work with vision, to work with text, to uh, do voice recognition, speech recognition or speech generation, to do personalization, to forecast time series, even for fraud detection or for operating contact centers, you can do all of this without knowing anything of a machine learning, just calling APIs, providing your data, and you get results. If you know about machine learning, if you want to do more uh, custom things, then we offer you the low-level services in which you can uh, work with your with the frameworks you already know, like uh, like Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow or Keras or MXNet or PyTorch or you know. Uh, glue on so you know uh horrible so any framework you you uh you know with machine learning can be run the platform if you are using something custom you can also run it on our platform of course so we give you the choice of different specialized hardware we give you also not only the full experience of, of managing this but in the past few years we've been adding something called the studio which are a lot of services to help you in every step of the machine learning cycle because doing machine learning is not easy. And machine learning is actually reinventing virtually every industry. We see media, healthcare, finance, automotive, industrial. We are already doing a lot of services specific for some verticals. For example, just four months ago, we announced a lot of new services in particular for the industrial sector about uh, predictive maintenance, about uh, artificial vision, about uh, monitoring all machines that were not prepared for the cloud, monitoring likely in the cloud. And we are doing the same for financial services and we are doing the same for healthcare. But if you want to do machine learning, custom machine learning on your own, it can be complex. And that's why we are offering many different services to help with uh, checking for bias on your data set, monitoring performance of your models, collecting data, labeling data, monitoring and so on and so forth. So today, you can deploy any machine learning workload you want, uh, you want in the cloud. I hope this was interesting. I hope you have now an idea in which ways we are uh, making the cloud different to maybe what it was 15 years ago. And um, as a takeaways, I would like to repeat you, cloud is not only some data centers interconnected with a network. The future seems to be serverless and you can use machine learning at any point, uh, no matter if your team has expertise or not, we have services for everyone to use machine learning. And don't forget, if you want to use AWS, we are going to be opening a new region in Spain in 2022. That's all I have, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier.
Thank you for this comprehensive walkthrough of all of the solutions on AWS. Wow, it was impressive to see you going all the way from reinventing the data center and how data center engineers now have more tools in order to do their to provide their solutions to the software developers. How can they do development without servers, right? And with uh, artificial intelligence, right? Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier, for this for this insightful uh, uh, yeah. presentation. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Right. Thank you. And uh, I think that we're going to move now to the Q and A sections. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, we have one, uh, and this is related uh, about the five G network. So, uh, well. Uh, what I saw in, in the chat is that uh, someone is asking if the transfer, well, with the, the 5G network, the transfer big data, big data uh, by simple file or uh, will send it by division or how does it work? So the question is when, when you're using 5G and this is about big, big, the big data in itself or? Yeah, the big data in itself. Well, so, uh, so, uh, so with with the with the five G probably what you will do is uh, you can acquire the data with five G, you can acquire it on the edge, and uh, you can send that data directly to AWS with a dedicated uh, connect connection. Uh, but that will be for storing the data. But if you want to manage big data on the edge, it's not going to be that big. So basically, what we see is you can do some pre computations. For example, so with that big data that you are acquiring, if a, if a customer is connecting to one particular cell, you can choose at that point to move some data from your central database to move, the, for example, the recommendation for the customer, you can move the chunk of the database to that particular cell close to where the customer is right now. So dynamically, you can choose to move data between the main store on the AWS region and the cell or the closest you know, cell where the customer is operating. Same thing for machine learning. You can actually run predictions on the uh, on the edge with this uh, model. So you could get the data on the 5G network, train the models in the cloud, in, in the region, in, in our data centers, and then deploy the train model to the edge. So you can run the predictions directly on the edge, but those predictions have been trained with the real data. So those are some of the ways in you can interact. So you, you will not be able very likely in the in the near future to run the whole big data analytics on the edge, but you will be able to train on the on the cloud, deploy the model in the edge, uh, get some pre-calculated analytics on the cloud, deploy the local subset to the edge where the customer is together. So the, the end user experience is much better. So we, we are talking here about saving a few tens of milliseconds. So for big data, sometimes it's not that important. So you only have to focus on the use cases that really make sense where you want to save those tens of milliseconds. But yeah, there, there are ways to actually get that. And we are okay. starting with web Yeah, and, and I guess it's, um, it's a topic that caught uh, you know, some attention. We have another question about the wavelength sure. zone, right? And, <laughs> and, and how to use that AWS, that AWS zone. Is that the same uh, platform as is that EC2? Or is that is the way of managing is it the same or is there things that are different? Are there limitations or constraints yeah. to be considered? Sure, uh, and again, super cool question. So let me ask for a second. I want to try and answer uh, your screen here if I can. Uh, that's not the one I want to share. Uh, this is the one, I guess. So yeah, so here you can see, uh, you know, so, so Basically, uh, on Wavelength, what you are going to be able is to deploy some of the services. So as of today, not all the services are available. And actually, I have to tell you exactly which ones are available. Uh, virtual machines, for sure, are going to be uh, are available as of today. But let me just for a second. So these are the services available today, OK? This is the list. So you have EC2, so virtual machines. You have elastic uh, block storage, so storage, hard drives. You have access to the uh, VPCs as of today. You have access to auto scaling and uh, clusters on EKS, clusters on WC, with ECS, and monitoring. So basically, that's kind, of the, uh, that's kind of the idea. If you need anything else, you can connect directly to the region. But those things are available as of today 
on the uh, on the edge already. The way to work with them is exactly the same. It's only when you choose to deploy, uh, in the same way that when you go to the AWS console, you choose to deploy on a region that can be a Eurobus one, Eurobus two. When you use a wavelength, you are deploying on a particular wavelength region, but you use exactly the same APIs, exactly the same uh, services. That's the beauty of this, that you can, uh, as a developer, it's very easy to extend your application to the edge where it makes sense. Very good, nice. We have also another question, one, one last question. Sure. So when, when using uh, multiple regions, right? You were talking about the 230 plus uh, points of presence and how the communications of the backbone on, on AWS helps you know, pr provide and deliver the applications with a different architecture. But, but I guess that implies also to designing maybe uh, data replication for your application on a different way for availability and for resiliency. Uh, I guess, are there any things to consider maybe on which regions to choose or, or how to set some of those things to make the most I don't know if of the backend, but of the resiliency parameters ultimately, and that infrastructure that AWS puts at, at the customer disposal. Sure. So uh, first thing is, if if you, uh, I saw you that you can use services at different levels of abstraction. So for instance, of services, for example, we have a service called uh, AWS Aurora, which is a managed database compatible with Postgres and MySQL. Aurora automatically, without you doing anything, when you store any data is going to store it in six different physical devices across three different zones within the same region. You don't have to do anything. It's done automatically. So every time you write, you write automatically to six different places in three different physical locations to make sure that you know you are within, within that. That happens also with Amazon S3 for storage. That happens also with, uh, with, with many of the services we, we offer, with DocumentDB compatible with MongoDB. So many of the services already have this multi-availability zone out of the box. Some services allow you to configure, if you want also, multi-region replication. So every time there is, for example, an, a change on S3, replicate multi-region. Or on, Glo on DynamoDB, you can configure a global table that every time you do a change, it replicates globally to another region. On Aurora, which is a SQL database, you can also configure multi-region replications. So some services, they have that out of the box. If you want to manage your own infrastructure, if you want to go lower level and you have you want to have recommendations, not only about, by the way, uh, about high availability, but about anything else, we have this framework, the well-architected framework, in which we have five pillars and we give you how you operate, in this case, will be for reliability, how you operate for high reliability, but also for security, operational excellence, performance, and cost optimization, which is important in the cloud. So we give you here the, uh, the, different, pilot, the different pillars. When you go here, you have uh, recommendations of how to have a highly available uh, you know, application, which will be the foundations, how to plan for your network, how to design your workloads, if you open the AWS console, you, uh, you can go through a self-service questionnaire in which we are going to be asking you uh, if, um, so we are going to be, we are going to be asking you uh, for your application. We have for each of the pillars about 30 questions and we are going to ask you what you are doing about that. And um, depending what you answer, we are going to give you some points. So, and we will tell you regarding security, we are 67 out of 100. Regarding, uh, and this, these things will take you to 100. And no one's at 100. 100 is like, you know, it's like the Nirvana. But in different dimensions, you can actually see actionable, uh, actionable points that you can take. You can actually, if you, uh, you can keep that snapshot and you can share with your team. And when you are improving your architecture, you can actually change the questions. You can see how you have been evolving. So we give you these tools, the well-architected framework and the well-architected tool. So you can uh, see by yourself our recommendations and also measure against yourself how you are doing on those recommendations. Because yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to start working with the cloud and we know that. So we give you these tools. So it's a bit easier. Also, of course, if you need more guidance, you have the partner network that can help you to deploy your workloads uh, if you prefer to have a partner helping you with that, a consultancy partner. 
Perfect. Well, uh, Javier, thank you so much for sharing your lo your knowledge. Uh, it's a pleasure. And well, thank you so much. Congratulations. And now uh, we have another uh, conference. So uh, keep it tuning. Don't miss the next one. Thank you so much. Have a good thank day. you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.